I want to take a minute and celebrate as we get started today. Uh, about six years ago, I uh, was spending time thinking, praying about the uh, direction of our church, where Cross Community was heading, what was the vision God had in store for us. And one of the things I believe he brought to us was this idea that we needed to build out, um, not just build up in one location. And so we had this idea that we wanted to start new work, start new campuses. And so we began to pray about a place, and we focused on a place, a place, a place. Uh, but really nothing ever materialized until we realized that God was bringing us a person and so what happened is, if you know the story of our church, God brought to us a guy named Matt Duke. And so Matt Duke, um, we began to talk to him. He and Angie, they were already in Pecola, already doing a work there. And we started to realize that what God was doing is he was wanting to call Matt Duke and Angie to go and, and plant a new campus there. And so here's what I want to celebrate with you this morning. I want to celebrate with those of you who are at Pecola this morning. In September, it will be five years. Can you believe that? Five years since we first started that campus. Could, could we celebrate that together? It's five years. It's five years of God's faithfulness. It's five years of, of solid, consistent, steady leadership from Matt. It's also steady leadership from Brandon Lopez. It's five years of, of working through um, our previous facility there in Pecola. You'll recall this if you've been at Pecola for a while, uh, a location that was so small that when somebody flushed the restroom, the entire service was disrupted. You know that. You've been there. But what I want to say to those of you who are at Pecola, um, you may not be aware of this, that when Matt Duke came on, um, he made incredible sacrifices to help that campus get launched uh, to the point that when he started, um, he was making $100 per week. Um, that was his stipend, but his heart was in it from the very beginning. And so I just, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to do this recently, but go up and, and hug his neck. Um, just tell him you love him, you appreciate him. He and Brandon both do an incredible job there, and I just celebrate. I look forward to another good five years and then another decade to come after that. Um, as you saw the bumper video, we are starting a new series today here, and the focus of it is the book of Ephesians. There are going to be three major themes that we hit, and I just want to lay these out for you so that you can see them now. As we walk through the book, there are three prayers, three things that we want to see happen in your life. The first is, the first major theme as we get into this book is for you to think biblically. And we, we want to be informed by what the Bible says. We want it to be the foundation of our lives and the filter um, for us. So we want you to think biblically. The second is we want you to live authentically. It's not enough just to know what to believe. You also need to know how to live it. And so as we walk through Ephesians, we're going to see Paul devotes a large section of his letter to teaching people how to live practically and authentically. The last is this. We want you to learn how to fight strategically. So we're going to be covering at the end of chapter 6 in Ephesians this idea of Paul saying you should put on the whole armor of God. So we're going to think biblically, we're going to, uh, we're going to live authentically, and then ultimately we want to learn how to fight strategically. So this is going to be the emphasis for us as we walk through the book of Ephesians. Now as we get started, we're going to begin actually in the middle of the book in chapter 4 in just a minute. The reason we're going to begin in the middle is because I want to give you a summary, kind of an overview of Paul's primary takeaway, the primary thrust of this letter that he writes to the book of Ephesus and that God wants to communicate to us. And so as I get started with that, I have to begin by making a confession to you. And the confession is that one way I've realized that I'm getting older, and not that I'm old yet, I, you know, but one of the ways I can tell that I'm getting older is when I have a really hard time comprehending the things that younger people do. Can anybody relate to that and give me a little bit of love, a little bit of an amen? Okay, so one of the ways that I realize, okay, I'm getting to be this like grumpy old preacher that I always did, said I would never be, is when I look at some of the things that younger people are doing and I'm like, why in the world do they do that? That makes no sense to me. Case in point, this past week I read about a guy named Jeff Teague. He is a 28-year-old able-bodied man who plays basketball professionally for the Indiana Pacers. And he is so good that he makes $8.8 .8 million per year. Now, if somebody wanted to pay me $8.8 .8 million a year, it would be hard to turn that down. So, Jeff T, go. I'm proud of you for what you're doing there. Here's what I would never do. Jeff T, 28 years old, making $8.8 .8 million a year, moved back in with his mama and his daddy. 
Now, where is the collective gasp? There, there needs to be like this collective like, oh, what? You know, when I was 18 years old, I, I, would, I would have just about lived anywhere on the face of the earth except for living with my mama and my daddy. I was ready. Like I would take my laundry home to my mama on the weekend so she could cook for me and take care of me, pamper me a little bit. But man, when, when the weekend was over, I wanted to go. I wanted to have my freedom. But something has happened, and I don't understand it. Now, I'll just tell you, I don't mean to be judgmental. I just don't have any choice. Like, I don't know any other alternative because what's happening is there's this thing called, uh, sociologists call it delayed adolescence. Some call it delayed uh, adulthood. But it's this, this idea that the, that the stage of adolescence that one time was like, you know, 12 to 17, 18 or something like that, is now extending and stretching into what was previously known as young adulthood. So that for the first time ever since the U.S. government has been taking a census, 130 years, this has never happened, this is a new phenomenon, the number one housing option for people who are 18 to 34 years old is that they live with their mama and their daddy. And so there are some times where you, you, you fall into hard times, and I get that, and so, but when you see there's this whole new shift taking place, I know, I'm a grumpy, fussy old preacher, but I'm just up here and I'm just like, Okay, I, it's hard for me to connect with. It's fine, you know, in a season of life or a year or two, whatever. But when there's this, this shift, like you've got guys in their mid-30s that they're still dreaming of becoming a video game designer while they're playing video games in their basement all day at their house. It's like, stop, I just don't get it. I, I realize this, that, that we are made for maturity. And so with my kids in our house right now, I know that when, if you want to be humbled as a parent, try to get your kids to eat something that they don't want to eat. Like I'm realizing, so in, in our house right now, Eden, she has these texture issues. And we didn't at first realize that what was going on. We just thought, okay, she's being picky in what she's eating. And we have had many like long, drawn-out battles. Like there were these sagas where we'd sit down and there was one particular occasion where it was like an hour and a half. And, and I had made the statement that whatever's on your plate, you're going to eat this. And so... We're like an hour into this, and she's been crying, and Aaron's over there holding her and consoling her, and I'm just like, I don't know what to do, but I've, you know, I've already told her she's going to eat what's over on her plate. So that was the key phrase in the story. Well, somehow or another, she managed to spit what was in her mouth back onto her plate. Talk about an ethical dilemma as a parent, right? I mean, you've communicated. You're going to eat whatever's on your plate. And so at this point, I'm like... I said it, so we've got to follow through with it. And I made my best effort. And so at this point, Eden's mad at me, Aaron's mad at me, everybody's mad at me because I'm the bad guy, you know, having to follow through. And I, I may have been in that situation, I don't know. But I know this, when she's three years old, I can deal with that. It's aggravating, it's frustrating to see her immaturity with regard to what it is that she's eating. But I know this, that if she's still 30 years old and she has an immaturity with regard to what she eats, she's going to shut herself off to a whole lot of opportunities. And we know this, is, is if you're a parent or if you're not a parent, you still get this, that, that ma- we are made for maturity. We are made to develop. And what you can accept and get along with when somebody is three years old, when they get to be 20 or 30, you stop and say, hold on, there's something wrong here if there's not maturity, if there's not development taking place. So in the same way that we would all say we need to mature physically, we also need to mature spiritually. In the same way that we are made for maturity physically, like we want to grow up and we want to get jobs and we want to be productive, we need to do that. That's how we're made, that's how we're wired. We are made physically for maturity, we're also made spiritually for maturity. Yet it's often the case that we get stuck, we get stunted in our spiritual development. And the core thrust, the core message of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus is simply this message that you need to mature. You need to move forward. You need to grow up. So what we're going to be doing and looking at these ideas of thinking biblically and living authentically and fighting strategically, we're going to be looking at what it means to grow up, what it means to mature spiritually. And what I want to do this morning is just to help you diagnose where you are spiritually. And I want to look at three signs of delayed spiritual adolescence. Three signs that there could be an area of your life where you need to mature, you need to grow. Now, for those of you who are prone toward guilt and self-condemnation, 
I don't want you to hear me saying three signs that you need to feel bad about yourself or three signs that you're a terrible Christian. We're just looking at three signs that are indicators. There are areas of your life where you need to grow. And, and so I'll say on the front end, these areas are going to apply to all of us in some form or fashion. But as we look at them, just evaluate and try to ask yourself the question, is this present in my life? Open with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, I want to show you three signs Essentially, if we're going to speak straightforward about this, three signs you need to grow up. Three signs of spiritual, delayed spiritual adolescence. The first is, number one, is lack of personal holiness. This is when your calling exceeds your character. Look with me, Ephesians 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul, he says, Therefore I, and this in chapter 4, is based upon everything that he's told them in chapters 1 through 3. He's given them a lot of doctrine, a lot of instruction in the first three chapters. He transitions to the practical takeaway. He says, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you. Now, freeze, if you would, on this word, implore. Um, There are different um, words that are used and different types of language that are used in the New Testament to try to communicate feeling or, or kind of the tone of communication. One of those words is called kerygma. And kerygma is like this large public proclamation that you would have like in a sanctuary. Another word is called didache. Didache is formal instruction that you might receive in a classroom. This type of word that Paul uses here when he says implore is called paracletic. And paracletic language is not the kind of language you would use in a large sanctuary. It's not the kind of language you would use in a classroom. It's the kind of language you would use in a coffee shop. It's the kind of language you would use if you were sitting and having coffee with somebody, if you were on the front porch talking with them and pleading with them and encouraging them. And so what Paul is doing here in chapter 4 is he's changing the tone. He's saying to them, you've had the large proclamation, you've received the formal instruction, now let me plead with you as one brother sitting across from another just having coffee. He says, I implore you, he goes on, to walk in a manner Worthy, that's the key word there, worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And he goes on to explain what that looks like. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the first thing that we see here that is a sign of, of delayed adolescence that we need to grow up is lack of personal holiness when you're calling exceeds your character. Now this word, if you look there, the word worthy, it's the word axios. And an axios was actually a balancing scales, a set of scales. And so if you had an axios, what you had is you had on on one hand of the, the scales, you had a counterweight, and it would be lead or some type of object. Say it weighed one pound. On the other side of that scales, there was another pan, and it would be empty. And so if you added to the other side of the scales, the empty scales, say flour or some kind of material, and you put one pound of of, of flour on that side of the scales, it would balance out. It would be even. And when those two objects were even with one another, when they were consistent with one another, when one object wasn't greater than or exceeded the other, they were known to be axios. They were known to be worthy. They were consistent with one another. And so what Paul is doing here is he's saying there's a balancing set. There's a set of scales here. Your calling is on one side. Your character is on the other. He says live in a way that that has to do with your character. Live in a way that is worthy or axios with your calling. So he says here's your calling. Here's your character. Your calling does not need to exceed or be greater than your character. Now this ought to challenge us. Because the calling that God has placed on us is not a low calling with low standards. It is a high calling, as Paul will flesh out in the rest of Ephesians 4. There's a high calling for those of us who are in Christ. And so Paul comes along and he says, in your calling, make sure that your calling isn't greater than your character. You need to see that those two things are axios, they are worthy, they are even, they're they're consistent. And and the, the picture that Paul gives here of what this looks like, if you look here in verse 2, he gives four adjectives to, that, that describe what it looks like if our character is developing. He says, with all humility, with gentleness, with patience, and tolerance. 
And tolerance, by the way, is not the 21st century understanding of the word where you have no opinion about something. Tolerance is when you genuinely don't like something and you still tolerate it. You put up with it. But Paul says, he says, if you have humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance for one another with love, being diligent, diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, that is when your character is worthy or axios or consistent with your calling. I find it fascinating that the things that Paul presents here, again, we're talking about spiritual maturity. But, but what we see from this by implication is this, that spiritual immaturity always produces relational pain. So let's stop for just a second and think about this. Look at this list. How much of the relational pain that you're experiencing in your life is a result of you not being humble but you being proud? Can, can I be the first to admit that I've had some relational pain due to my spiritual immaturity and my pride? Your, your lack of gentleness. And some of you men, you're so harsh at home. You're so harsh with the people that you deal with. You don't have gentleness about you. And much of the relational pain that you're experiencing is not just because you've been wired a certain way. It, it's because you have an immaturity there. That spiritual immaturity is producing a relational pain because you're harsh in your environments and you're pushing people away. Gentleness with patience. How many of your relational people problems would be better if you were more patient? And if you don't mind me prying for just a moment, how many of your financial problems would be better if you had patience? See, these things are not just physical problems. They're at their core spiritual problems. So the spiritual immaturity we have produces physical pain. And so we see this, the first sign that you need to grow up is this. Number one is a lack of personal holiness. When your calling exceeds your character, when you're not growing personally. The second sign that you need to grow up is this. Number one, we see lack of personal holiness. Number two is this, it's self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. Essentially, when you consume without contributing. Notice what Paul says to the people here in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 4. Paul says, There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Notice the corporate nature of this letter. Paul is saying that you're all in this together. There is one, there is one, there is one. It is not just you, it is everybody. He goes on, based upon this, verses four, or verse 7 and 11, he says, But to each one of us was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So personalize this for just a moment. You have been given a measure of Christ's gift. If you're part of that one, if you're part of that church, God has given something to you. Verse 11, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers. He talks about roles here. Verse 12, Here's the purpose for which God gave those things. For... The equipping of the saints. He doesn't just say for the equipping of the individual. Now, who here wants to be blessed? I'll raise my hand and say, I want to be blessed. Who here wants to see God do good things in your life? I want to see God do, th good, do things in my life. But Paul's saying here, the reason that God has given you these gifts is not just for your own good, but for the collective good of others as well. And so uh, if you come and you have a, a self-centered idea or mentality where you feel as if you can consume without contributing, that is an indicator that you need to grow up. It is an indicator that there is immaturity present for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, the collective plural body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So Paul is pushing us toward here an, a, a we before me kind of mindset. I read about a cartoon recently where in that cartoon there were a number of people who were circled around a table and that each person who was there around the table had a bowl of soup in front of them. The challenge is that they had spoons that were so long they couldn't feed themselves. And so everybody's there in front of the table. They have soup in front of them. But the instrument that they have, the spoon that they have, is so long that they don't have a way to feed themselves. So if everybody is going to be fed, it requires that they take the spoon and they take what they have been given and they use it to feed the person who is beside them. They use it to feed others. That's a picture of what the church needs to be doing. 
That's a picture really of what the family and every other entity needs to be doing, but especially in the church. We need to realize that God has given us something, and so we need to be contributing what we have consumed. There's nothing wrong with consuming. We have to receive before we can give. But once we consume, we have to realize that the next step is to contribute. And it may very well be that the reason you're not able to consume much and God is not giving much is because you've hoarded that which God has already given. He says, All right, I'm not going to continue to bless you with more until you're first a good steward with what I've already given you. I'm not going to pour more soup into your bowl until you take your spoon and realize that, that, that I've created that spoon for you to help other people be fed, not just for you to be fed. And so I say all that to just ask this question. Who are you feeding? Who is better off spiritually because of what God has done in your life? An indicator of, of spiritual immaturity is that you're consuming and being fed, but you're not contributing and feeding others. Um, I, I posted a couple of months ago on Facebook, and I asked the question, I said, um, what do you think uh, a church ought to expect from its members, and what do you think members ought to expect from the church? And it was, it was very interesting, the responses that I received, and I think everybody in this church gave a perfect response, but people on the outside of this, I struggled to understand some of their responses, because the, the general sense was from, from people who said what should a members expect from the church there were some good things that they said you know the church should be there for them the church should love them the church should embrace them all that stuff I'm like yes that is good but when it came to understanding what the church should expect from its members I walked away thinking there there's an awfully low standard and when people have an idea of what the church ought to expect from the membership, it's essentially, get out of my space, let me live my life, I'll come and I'll, I'll consume. But for a lot of the folks who responded, it left me scratching my head thinking, is it really the case that God doesn't have any expectations for people who are part of the church? And here, here's what I want to say to you this morning, and then I'll move on. You and I have a high calling. We have a high calling to take the gospel of Jesus to this community and to this entire county. We have an, a high calling to let people know about the eternal life that is found in Jesus. We have a high, high calling. And a high calling is not accomplished with low standards. And so one of the reasons we're committed here to always going back to the scriptures and, and asking the question, what does God want from us as a church? One of the reasons we're committed to not being a church that is just all fluff and, you know, you come in and you get a little five minute whatever and then you go along your way. One of the reasons that I want us as a body to be known, not just as a church where more people are coming, but where more people are growing in their faith and being transformed in the image of Jesus is because I believe this, that the, the call for us as a church is not just to come and consume, but for us to come consume and contribute for us to come to grow and to go and so it's it's just an indicator of immaturity if you've not made that transition and so for all of us we just need to stop and say am i feeding people in my life with what god has given me am i using this in my workplace am i using this in in the church am i using this in the family where god has placed me the third sign of of immaturity or delayed spiritual adolescence, the third sign that you need to grow up is this. We see lack of personal holiness. We see self-centeredness. And the third is this, is biblical illiteracy. Biblical illiteracy, number three. If you look with me, verses 14 and 15, Paul, he says this. He says, as a result, we are no longer to be children. So as a result of you feeding other people, as a result of you using the gifts that God has given you, as a result, we are no longer to be children. Insert the word there, immature. We're no longer to be immature. We're no longer to have delayed spiritual adolescence. We're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. If you're not committing yourself to understanding the scriptures, 
not in a legalistic pursuit of just having more knowledge, but not committing yourself to the Scriptures, to understand what the Scriptures say to you, about you, for your life, about God, it is an indicator that there is some delayed spiritual adolescence. And in the same way you can't grow in your job without learning and expanding your knowledge base, you can't really grow in your spiritual life without understanding and growing in your knowledge base of who God is and who you are in Him. Uh, we had, it's been a year or so ago, and Jason Waymar, executive pastor here, um, he was visiting with somebody in the community, and this, this particular lady had visited our church, and he was asking her, you know, what was your overall experience, and you know, what was it like for you, and she wasn't sure if she was going to come back or not, and, and he was just trying to find out, you know, what, what, were, what were things like for you, and she said, well, it was, it was all right, you know, it was good, it was okay, she said, it felt kind of like a Bible study, and I, as I heard Jason tell the story, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not hearing what the problem is, but for her, you know, kind of her expectation and what she was wanting, I guess, was kind of like more this, I don't know, rah-rah type thing, I'm not exactly sure what it was that she wanted, but when I heard that, she didn't really mean it as a compliment, but I thought to myself, you're darn right it sounds like a Bible study, because we don't need to gather together and, and, and rally around my collective wisdom. You know, we don't need to gather together and figure out what the, the latest trend is in the psychological world. We need to figure out what the enduring, timeless scriptures say about living in this world today. And so when we come together as a church, we want to be very firm in our conviction that, that our, our guidance is taken from the scriptures. We believe that Jesus, whose life is recorded, whose words are recorded, is far wiser than any of us combined together. So we look to him. And so when we gather together, we make no apologies about talking to you about axios and paracletic language and things that are a little deeper in the scriptures because we just want you to understand how to get grounded in your faith and understand the scriptures for yourself. And so we want to, and I want to, every Sunday morning, I want for you to be fed. But if the only meal you receive is on a Sunday morning, then over the course of time, you're going to be malnourished. And so that's why I want to say to you, just, just give you this brief challenge. If, you're, if you have this biblical illiteracy and, and you're not really consuming the Scripture for yourself on a regular basis, I would just encourage you that if you want to mature in your life spiritually, that you need to begin doing that. Now, let, let me give you uh, what I believe is just a very profound, central truth. And so this, this whole message really revolves around these two words. So if you want something uh, very profound, here's the central truth that I want to give to you today. Grow up. It's essentially what Paul is saying to the church. You look in verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects, into Him who is the head, even Christ. Now, the, the real driver for this and the motive behind us growing up is not because God wants to look at us and say, you're a terrible person, you're still just like a child. The, the motive that, that, that God gives for us growing in Him and maturing in us is that as we develop in our maturity, we develop in our opportunities. And there is a connection between the opportunities that we experience and the maturity that we've developed. This coming Saturday night, I'm going to go and take my little daughter, Eden, to a daddy-daughter dance. And just a, a quick aside, there was a friend of mine who pastored a church. He took his daughter to a daddy-daughter dance. That very next morning, the deacons, deacons were in his office waiting on him to confront him because he had gone and danced with his daughter. I want to say hallelujah and praise God that I'm going to go to a daddy-daughter dance and there may be some of our deacons there with them. I just think that that, that, is, just, that is just junk that, that people have had to deal with that. So that aside, let's go back. I'm going to go to this, this dance and I'm going to take her and I'm going to treat her like a little princess. And from the very early days, I've, I've tried to affirm and to, to try to help her to see that daddy loves you and wants the very best for you. That I will be here, I will protect you, you can count on me, and I'm going to be committed to her, even when she doesn't understand it, even when she doesn't realize it. My greatest goal is her good. Dads, you amen to that, right? That's what you want as the father figure. 
And so as I raise her for the next 30 years or so before she gets ready to date, I'm going to try to help her to understand the, the significance of her realizing her value and her daddy's heart toward her. Maybe not 30, maybe 28. <laughs> so if, if some knucklehead boy comes along when she's 17 or 18 and, man, she's thinking, you know, all my friends have got boyfriends and they're, they're doing all this stuff and, and there's this boy and he's cute and he's whatever and, 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 you know, he comes along and he's just this knucklehead boy. He's already, you know, he's dropped out of school and can't hold down a job and his grand vision for his life is to be a video game designer and so he spends all his evenings in the basement of his parents' house playing video games and Again, I'm sorry for judging, but I just can't help it. I don't feel like I have an option. So that's, that's kind of what he does. And he comes along and he takes an interest in my daughter. And he wants an opportunity to see her, to date her, to spend time with her. I will say to that young man, no way in heaven or hell are you going to do that. And I'm, here's the thing, I'm going to do everything within my power, and I get it, and, you know, a lot, lot happens in life and whatever, but I'm going to do everything in my power to help my daughter realize that there are some things that, that, that there will not be the right opportunity until there is first the maturity that produces the right opportunity. And there's some of you in your life, you've been praying to God for opportunity, and you say, God, I want this opportunity, I want this opportunity, and God would say to you, I want you to have that opportunity. But first, you have to have maturity. Man, I'll be honest with you. I don't want my girl to have the opportunity to get married. But if God works in my life by the time she's 25 or whatever that age is, I'm going to want that for her. Right? I'm going to want her to have that opportunity, but not if she or the person that she's with doesn't have the maturity. It could be the case that the, the main message that God would want to speak to you today, that you've wanted this new opportunity, you've prayed for this job, you've prayed for this relationship, you've prayed for this breakthrough opportunity. God would say, I want to give you the opportunity, but the first thing is, is I need to see maturity in you. Because if you get this opportunity right now, and you don't have a maturity that's sufficient to enable you to, 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 to handle this opportunity, the opportunity is actually going to be for your harm, not for your good. And your Father in Heaven doesn't want that. He wants to give the opportunity, but He wants to give it when you have the maturity. So let's focus on that. We want to think biblically, we want to live authentically, and we want to fight strategically. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this letter. I thank You for the words that Paul wrote to Ephesus and the words that You speak to us today that call us to grow up in our spiritual development. As I walk through this passage, I see areas of my own life of, of impatience and harshness and, and pride. Areas that I need to be regularly surrendering to you because the truth is I have immaturity in me. And so I pray that as you are growing and developing me, I pray that you are growing and developing every person in the life of this church. And so we just surrender this morning and we say, God, we want to be people who grow up. We want to be people who think biblically, who live authentically, and ultimately people who fight strategically. We pray together as your church in Jesus' name. Amen.